like to encourage everyone to get a songbook and we'll sing number 12 will be our first song. Number 12. One, two. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise, proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, sun and moon. Stars on high, praise him all ye have of heaven, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise and give Jehovah for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his gift. Jehovah, they are made at His command. Then forever He established His decree shall ever stand from the earth. Oh, praise Jehovah, all ye flood. Dragons all, fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them praise and give Jehovah for his name alone is high. song will be number 826. <clears throat> 826, and after this song, we'll be led in our second prayer. Number 826.
If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if his care has been constant and tender and true, if the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell of your gladness today? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If your faith in the Savior has brought its reward, if a strength you have found in the strength of your Lord, if the hope of a rest in his palace is sweet, oh, will you not, brother, the story repeat? Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? souls all around you are living in sin. If the master has told you to bid them come in, if the sweet invitation they never have heard, oh, will you not tell them the cheer-bringing word? Oh, will you not tell it to Pray with me, please. Our Father, it's with deepest gratitude as we humble ourselves before you this morning and contemplate this act of worship, the things that we say, the things that we participate in, the things that we hear as we offer the, these unto thee and as worship. We pray that they're acceptable, and that you might receive them. Oftentimes, Father, we're mindful of the things that are about us, especially of those that have not rendered obedience unto thee. We're mindful of those that are among us this morning that we call family and friends that haven't rendered obedience unto thee. We pray as they're at the threshold of salvation that they might truly contemplate their eternity, that we might expound to them out of love the truth of the gospel that they might not be deceived any longer, that they might render obedience unto thee before it's everlasting too late. We're mindful of those that are outside of this assembly, that are in the world. And oftentimes we forget, Father, as your children, that Christ died for all mankind. and that we are in need of a Savior, one that humbled himself, was obedient in all things, and was crucified for each of us. We're thankful for Christ fulfilling you, your promise, 
and was resurrected, sitting at your right hand, interceding for each of us. Not only for us, but for all men, if we're obedient unto thee. We also gain comfort in knowing that he was tempted in all ways, but yet he was obedient. As we approach thee and we ask of thee, we know it's through thy son's name that our petitions are offered up unto thee and that thy son understands our temptations. We know that through thy word that we gain great comfort knowing that with every temptation in thy word is a way of escape. We pray that we look for this that we continue to educate our, our lives and our minds that we might be able to seek this way of escape out, that we might be pleasing unto thee. Oftentimes when we do stumble that we ask that we gain control of ourselves, that we might repent and strive to do that wrong no more. We're also mindful of the, those that are widowed among us, that we remember the scripture, that pure and undefiled religion before you is to take care of widows and orphans in their need. Help us to remember that we are truly blessed not only in spiritual blessings, but in physical blessings. We pray as we have opportunity and we purposed in our hearts to give back unto thee, that we might be a cheerful giver, that we give in a way that would be pleasing unto thee. We're also mindful of us Howard has mentioned those that have recovered. We pray that this might continue. We pray that you bless us individually. You bless us as a congregation. We pray for blessings upon our eldership. That they'll continue to seek to have truth taught here. As Howard mentioned, we're thankful for HD and the time that he has been before us. We pray that you'll ease his, you'll ease his mind in this transition, that he'll lean upon thee and the promise that's within thy word that we might encourage him. We're also mindful of our missionaries that we support. We pray that they might continue in your work and that we might mentally and monetarily continue to support them as they endeavor to spread thy name for them throughout a lost and dying world. We ask now that you bless the young among us, especially our young adults that are fixing to graduate and oftentimes move to different cities and towns to educate themselves. We pray that as they do this, that they'll always keep thee first that they'll seek out a school that there might be a sound congregation that they might continue to be faithful unto thee. Help them to not be deceived either, knowing that oftentimes amongst their peers that we are losing 
souls to the world. We pray that this might not be so in their case, that we might encourage them and uplift them. And that we'll do what the scripture says, that we'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that you'll take care and bless us. Watch over us now. Continue to love us as we love thee. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Preparations for the Lord's Supper will sing number 946. Number 946. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the many blessings you us. Be with us as we partake of this bread that represents your son's body that was untouched by sin, that hung on the cross for sins that we committed, and the, the perfect sacrifice that hung up there and was tormented in, in pain and anguish. 
and be with us as we take this and clear out everything from our mind and reflect back to that day on that cross. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Holy God, as we bow before you once more during this memorial that we proclaim the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At this time, Father, as we partake of the fruit of the vine, help us to mentally paint that picture as best we can of that day and the beating that our Savior went through that we may have a hope for eternal life through repentance of our sins as he is the propitiation of those things. We pray, Father, that all things outside this world that may interrupt our thoughts and concentration will be regimented in the, in the need to void those things out of our concentration. We can concentrate on the importance of this memorial and the partaking of the fruit of the vine at this time. This is our prayer in Christ's name, amen.
This concludes our communion worship, separate and apart, and as we go back to worship, that we will take this time to lay by in store. Will you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, it's with thanksgiving at this time that we reflect upon all the material blessings that you bless us with. And as we do so, we pray, Father, with a cheerful giving heart that we will give back in a manner pleasing in thy sight. We pray for the elders as they oversee these funds that they may do so, that they further the kingdom with it. It's in Christ's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. If you at this time marking your song books, number 488. Number 488 will be our song of encouragement after HD's lesson. And after marking that, we'll sing number 611. 611 before the scripture reading and the lesson. Let's stand for this song, please, if it's convenient. 611. Give me the Bible, star of gladness, gleaming. This cause no storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. And promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold a face lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal, hold up that splendor by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven shining portal. Show me the glory gilding Jordan's way. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Free. 
The first scripture reading this morning will be coming from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the, in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And next, chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And the final uh, scripture is chapter 7, verse 5. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wooden images and burn their carved images with fire. be with you today. I've seen some tragic things in the church, and I've seen some funny things. I remember when I first began to preach that I went up to the pulpit <clears throat> and I found myself to be quite nervous, one of my first sermons, first congregation. And I was just so nervous I couldn't hardly talk. And one of the deacons there had befriended me. And so as I stood in the pulpit, <clears throat> I just asked him to say a prayer. And as he was saying the prayer, I bowed my head and I saw that my pants were unzipped. And at that time, I moved around the pulpit like a Roman coyote. And so I knew this is not going to work. So very rapidly, I zipped them up. Just one problem. My tie got caught in the zipper. Some of you have asked me why I don't like to wear a tie. They're dangerous. I mean, what are you going to do? Here's a guy praying. Your tie is stuck in your zipper. And this guy didn't pray very long, so I thought, man, what am I going to do? So I got down behind the pulpit. And I worked and I worked. I nearly had to take my pants completely off to get that tie out of that zipper. Well, I finally got it out. The zipper finally gave loose. My tie came loose. And I thought, everything's going to be fine. I got everything back together. I'm still behind the pulpit. And I don't hear any praying going on. In fact, all I hear is dead silence. And most of these people at this point don't even know me. You know, after a few years, they, they'd have thought nothing of it, but they had just hired me, and they're ready for the sermon, and then there's no one in the pulpit. And I heard someone on the front row say, where did the preacher go? So I thought, well, how am I going to handle this? So behind the pulpit, I went like this. And when I looked out, every eye in the room was right there. 
Well, what would you have done? I said, hello. <laughs> and then just began to preach. So now you know one of the reasons I hate those dangerous Western article ties. They can just really cause you problems. But down through the years, God has been so good to me. He has surrounded me with wonderful people like y'all who have encouraged me through the years. Now, if you have your Bible with you, I would like for you to turn to Deuteronomy 5, verse number 16. The book of Deuteronomy is filled with so many lessons for us. Now, we got to understand we are no longer subject to Old Testament law. Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, Jeremiah said, The days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Hebrews 8, 6 through 9 says that new covenant came through Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. So we live under the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, I am under law to Christ. Colossians 2, 14 through 17, that old law was nailed to the cross. So we're not under those specific laws. So anyone tries to bind something on you, in the Old Testament that you can't find in the New Testament, you know you're getting a bill of goods. And yet, we have to understand there are so many eternal principles in the Old Testament that are good forever. <clears throat> in chapter 5, Verse 16. Moses is giving this speech to the children of Israel before they go and inherit their land. And he says, Honor thy father and mother. That's a commandment of God. That your days may be prolonged. That it may go well with you. When you get into the land which the Lord thy God has given thee. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Therefore, when God gives law, it springs from His love. When God gives man law, that's because of his concern for man. Look at the world. We don't do good on our own. Look at the mess it's in. That's from people not following God. And look at it. People hate each other because the color of skin they were born with. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? The world's in turmoil because people are not following God. And what I'm saying is the commands of God are for my good. God made me. He knows what makes me happy. He knows what makes me a fulfilled person. And thus His law came from that knowledge. The laws for our good. 1 John 5, 3, We obey God because we love Him. 
And John says, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 3. That word grievous means burdensome. God's laws are not a burden. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke of, upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. John 10, verse 10, Jesus explained, I didn't come to give you another burden. We got a tub full of them already. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Life to the full. Jesus came to give us life to the full, not to burden us down. John 6, 63, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 1, 4 and 5, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. That light that shines within our souls, the Word of God brings us peace and contentment and serenity in a world that is filled with violence, hatred, and prejudice. A beautiful word. And so we sing the song, Give Me the Bible. They're going to go into a new land. But what you have to understand, there was a lot of religions already there. When they walked in the door, there was all kind of religions when they got into the land. Now, how would God expect them to deal with that? Did God say, well, you know, you have to get along with everyone. And I want you to go into that land, and I want you to learn how to get along with all of these people. And their religion and their culture and their ideas and their ways of living are so different than yours. But I want you to love diversity. I want you to study their religion. I want you to understand it. And I want you to take the good parts of their religion, for there's good in all religions, they say. I want you to take the good out of it and I want you to incorporate it into your own religion even though it's different than yours. Is that what God said? I didn't hear an amen. You know, that's like saying sick them to a bulldog when you hear an amen or two. How were they to react? What did God demand? Just accept everybody like they are? You know, a lot of people think since God is love, 1 John 4, 8 says God is love, they think that's love. And they think that brings harmony. Harmony and unity, to just accept everything and everybody. Well, God is love, and His Scriptures bring unity. And what I have said to you, that is the exact opposite of what God said. Now, are we going to believe God 
or the culture in which we live? Are we going to believe God or a culture that is tainted with sin and greed and lust for power? Are we going to believe that culture or are we going to believe God? Let me tell you what God said. Just look in your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 5. Now, you couldn't make it more clear. God tells them, when you get into the land, this is how you deal with those people. I want you to look at how clear God is. Four points. This is how you deal with their religion. Number one, Deuteronomy 7 5, destroy their altars. Now get that. What do you say to do? Destroy their altars. That's where they had their worship. Shouldn't we respect other people's worship, even though it's different than we have learned, even though their tradition is different than our tradition? Shouldn't we respect other people's worship? Is that what God said? Destroy their altars. Look at the second thing. Break down their images. Tear them down. And three, cut down their groves. Now that's where they would go and have all these religious acts. That's where they would go to worship. Cut it down. Cut it down. And look at the fourth thing. And destroy their graven images with fire. You believe the Bible? Oh yeah, I believe the Bible. I tell you what, this verse makes the liberals as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. They can't answer it. All they can say is things like, well, that was the Old Testament. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the Old Testament. Romans 15, 4 talks of the Old Testament and whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. We learn from the Old Testament God's attitude toward false worship, false religion. You see, when they went into this land, God had revealed through Moses the true religion. He had revealed it. Now these people in the land, where did they get their religion? Where did it come from? Man, man-made ideas, burning little babies in a fire to satisfy some absurd fire god, sacrificing their own children. That's their religion. And God says they don't even deserve to live. 
People who do that don't even deserve to live. So when you go in there, don't be influenced by their religion. Don't marry them. Because if you marry them, they'll influence your children to go off into false religion. But guess what? God's people did not listen. Can you believe that? They didn't listen. I don't know why. I don't know why. But they didn't listen. They tolerated false religion. And eventually, because they tolerated it, eventually they accepted it. And then eventually they worship that way. Manasseh, a king of, of God's people, burned one of his children in fire. That's one of God's kings. You tolerate something, then you accept it, then you do it. So they had to be taken away from their precious land. Had to be taken away. The New Testament makes it clear. Galatians chapter 2 verse 5 and following. They had a problem in the church. Was somebody in the church wanting to bind something that God didn't bind? And Paul stood up and he said, we didn't give in to it for an hour. Oh, that's a colloquial expression. We would say, because we think everything in fast terms, we would say, I didn't give in to it for a second. Why did he not compromise? He could have brought more harmony to the church to compromise the truth. Paul says, I didn't give in to them for an hour. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. We can't compromise. God's people can't compromise. It's indispensable in marriage. You don't compromise in marriage, you ain't got much of marriage. You've got to compromise. Not on religion but on matters of opinion because everybody's got a different one and everybody's just as good as another one. So you have to learn to give and to take, but not in religion. God's revealed His religion and He says don't stray from it. There's no compromise with it. Romans 16, 17, and 18, I beseech you by the Lord Jesus Christ that you mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not their own serve not the Lord but their own bellies and by their good words and fair speeches they deceive the hearts of the simple. So the church is told the same thing in principle as the Israelites were told in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Try the spirits. Test. Try the spirits whether they be of God because many false prophets have gone out in the world. 1 John 4, 1. 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2, As there were false prophets among the people, there will be false teachers among you who will privily bring in damnable heresies and will bring swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow the pernicious ways by reason of whom the evil of the way of truth will be evil spoken of. 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, Paul talked about false religion and he says look it'll eat like a cancer it'll eat like a canker 
it'll eat like a gangrene. And he says, I want to tell you about two of them in the church, and he called them out by name. 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. He says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and they overthrow the faith of some. So when we compromise with our religious conviction, people's faith can be overthrown. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. He's given all these beautiful laws, and he says, look, I want these laws to always be in your heart. Reminds us of Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy law have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Moses said, I want these laws to be in your heart. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. Look what he said in verse 7. And teach them diligently unto your children. When do you teach them? Sunday, Wednesday. Is that good enough? When do you teach them? Look what he said. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Man, that means teach your children all the time God's Word. Teach them all the time. Now notice what it says in Ephesians 6, 4. You see, we're one generation away from apostasy in the church. If there's just one generation we don't teach, apostasy can come. We can take them to Six Flags and have all these parties and all these dinner things. and that. I'm not, I'm not a opposed to that kind of like it myself but if that's all we do is entertain them and take them places and have little lunches for them and do sweet little things for them we have betrayed them the church must teach them God's way look at Ephesians 6 4 in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Ooh, did I make many mistakes, sir? I'd make Clint Simmons so mad, and he's about, looked like about nine feet taller than me. He'd just take it. You just take it. But I got a funny way about me. Sometimes, well, a lot of times. When I get something in my mind, I just go on and on and on until it even gets tired to me. Clint, just stand there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many times I provoked that child to wrath? That's sin. You can go too far. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. But the bad thing is, I don't get another turn. You get one turn with those kids and that's it. And it's gone like that 
for you know they're gone. And you think, what have I done? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do it? Too late then. Too late then. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but look what he says, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That means teaching. Those Greek words mean teaching, instruction, and discipline. Now, I want you to look at Ephesians 6, 4. Who did he say? Mothers? Uh, I let my woman do the religious teaching. Is that second blue jeans or third opinion? He doesn't say mothers. Fathers, bring your children up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. Oh, guys, what a responsibility we have. We are to be the spiritual leaders of the home. And not like our last president, we're not to lead from behind, which is not leading at all. We are the spiritual leaders. What a responsibility. Why well, don't I have time to teach my children? I just don't have time. You'll stand before God with that flimsy excuse. You'll stand because God said do it. He didn't say if you have time. If you're not too busy. He said fathers do it. Now don't misunderstand me. Mothers can help. And they do in a wonderful way. The church can help. And it should. But it's the main responsibility of the Father. When I first came here, that's one of the reasons I implemented pew packers and vacation Bible school. So our children could learn and the more I saw them learn, the happier it made me. Plus, in VBS, I just like to be around them. More than the adults? Yes. Yes. I loved it. But, for health reason, I couldn't continue. I wish I could have. That's that's one of the neatest things I I could do here, is teach your beautiful children the beauty of the Bible. Children are not being taught. They spend they spend too much time on social media and electronic devices. I see them walking down the street. They don't have to interact with anybody. Just text them. Or, if you're President Trump, just tweet to the whole country. Here's who I'm firing. That's a nice way to get fired. Find it on a tweet. Isn't that nice? Well, I'd have never known because I don't do tweet. They're spending too much time with electronics and not enough time with God. And it's the fault of the parents because they're doing the same thing. 
You know how many people are killed every year? When they tell us don't text and drive? Where do you think the kids got it from? The parents. We just don't have time. Let me tell you something. From somebody that's gone before, you better make time. There's nothing more precious than your dear children. They need to hear their mothers and daddies read from the Bible. Not some little book that some denominational guy wrote about how to be more spiritual. They need to hear their mamas and daddies read from the Bible. We got a problem in the church. Oh, well, we got more than one, but let me tell you the main one. Lack of respect for biblical authority. Thus, people don't teach their children. You know, if they come to every Bible class, that's only a few minutes a week. Don't depend on the church to teach your children. That's not the responsibility of the church. That's the responsibility of the home. Our Bible class are to reinforce what you're supposed to be doing at home. Teaching them God's Word every day. If my parents had taught me the Bible every day, I would be the best preacher you ever heard. If they had taught me those verses since I was a young child, I tell you what, I would preach up a storm. But they were busy making a living and other things. And so I didn't get that. So I had to start at 18 to learn the very basic stories of Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham, people I never heard of, people I never knew existed. And it was hard. It was real hard. We have a lack of respect in the church for Bible authority so people don't understand how we should deal with false religion. And when we do, they just panic. Lack of respect for Bible authority. We have a lack of respect for Bible authority when people know what they have to do to be saved and they sit here Sunday after Sunday and won't move. If I could come grab your hand and do it for you. How happily I'd do that. But that's not the way God set it up. Your heart has to move you. And when you believe He's God's Son, you're going to have to turn away from this rotten, wicked world, turn away from your sins, and you're going to have to be immersed in water to have those sins forgiven. And that's the only way your sins will ever be taken away by the blood of Jesus. You can do that right now. Does thou count all things for Jesus but lost? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in that crimson blood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. As thou dominion ourself and our sin is thy heart right with God over all evil without and within
Jesus control as I heart right with God. Does each moment abide in thy soul as I heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in that crimson flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. <clears throat> I want to thank H. Steve for that lesson, and I know every one of us in this eldership wholeheartedly to endorse those things he preached and about the need to teach our children at every moment and every opportunity of every day that it is the parents' responsibilities. And I remember what God said of Abraham in Genesis 18 and 19, that he knew, he knew Abraham was the kind of father who would teach his children and his household to follow after the ways of the Lord. That's one of the reasons he chose a man like Abraham and called him out of his country. And that's the type of fathers that we all need to be. And thank you again to H.D. for that lesson. And for all the years of service he's given unto this congregation and, and even to all the years of service he's given to preaching the gospel. We're thankful for faithful men like him. Thank you, H.D. A closing is on me number 688. 688, and if you filled out your attendance cards, if you'll pass those to the aisles, we'll have some young men pick those up as we sing this song. After this song, we'll be led in our closing prayer. Remind everyone of our evening worship at 6 p.m. And the Bible, 530, what time is supposed to be here? The kids should be here at 545 for the few packers. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We will rest in the fair and happy land by and by just across from the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by, and dwell with Jesus evermore. Filled with delight, my raptured soul would hear no across from the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by and dwell with Jesus evermore. <coughs> Shall we pray? Loving God and Father, we humbly come before you. We thank you that we can come before the creator of this universe and petition you on things that we have need of. We ask you to be with those that are sick, need your guiding hand, and the doctors that administer to them that things being done to them will be beneficial to their health and they can be back with us soon. We thank you for this congregation and what it represents and 
the four elders that guide her, and thank you for the time that HD has spent in study and meditation and bringing us lessons that we can apply to our life. Help each of us take this lesson today that not only as parents, but also as grandparents, that we see need the time that we can teach our children and our grandchildren your word. We thank you for your son, especially in the time that he came and spent on this earth and taught people of your word only to be ridiculed and to be spat upon and to be crucified on that cruel cross. But we know it was, it was in your ultimate wisdom and your plan that he come and shed his blood on our behalf that we have the redemption through him if we're obedient to your will. And it's through his blessed name that we pray. Amen.